One topic of special consideration when discussing epithelial tissue is glands. Uh, one of the things that we noted epithelial tissue does is it is usually the tissue that is going to be involved in secreting things. And uh, while many tissues secrete things, many different cells will secrete things, uh, glands are sort of the specialized organs responsible for secreting things, either out of the body or into the body, typically into the blood. We will discuss glands in greater detail uh, when we talk about the endocrine system in ANP2. Uh, but there are some glands that we're going to talk about before then. So there is a basic set of information that I want you guys to have about the different types of glands and how they work. So uh, epithelial tissue is good at absorbing things and secreting things. We know Absorbing things are the epithelial tissue in your lungs that can absorb oxygen, the epithelial lining of your intestines that absorbs nutrients, uh, organs that secrete things or that are primarily used for secreting are called often glands. There are many shapes and sizes of glands. Some are large and complicated. Some are small and may have only a single function. But generally speaking, glands are either secreting directly into the blood, in which case they are endocrine glands, or they secrete into a duct. And that duct will typically lead somewhere outside of the body, either onto the skin or into one of the body's interior areas that have access to the outside world. Basically anywhere that the outside world has contact with, uh, that it doesn't have to actually pierce your body's barriers to get to. So for instance, your entire intestinal tract is technically outside your body. Food goes in one end and then out the other, and it never has to actually cross your body's barriers to do that that a ducted gland that secretes outside of your body is called an exocrine gland. A paracrine secretion is a thing that happens where cells secrete and then that affects nearby cells. Usually paracrine secreting organs are not a part of a formalized gland. They're just cells that are next to other cells and they secrete things. Um, but there's no specialized structure that has them do that. Uh, endocrine glands are going to be discussed specifically in the endocrine section. We're going to talk exten more extensively about exocrine glands here. Typically a duct is a tube, usually lined with epithelial tissue, and this is going to channel the secretion where it is supposed to go. So for instance, uh, you might have, oink, uh, you might have a, uh, a set of tissue here that secretes a substance, which I'm gonna draw here in blue. And then you have a lined area that channels that blue substance to the surface of the skin. And so this may be um, the substance that you're secreting is sweat, right? And then this would be a sweat gland with the sweat coming out of a pore. And this duct here 
is going to be the area that connects the secreting tissue to the area where the secretion is supposed to show up. Exocrine glands are uh, labeled and defined by their shape and their topology, uh, which is how their, their surfaces are arranged together. Um, and they are also classified by their function, how they work. In terms of shape, they can be either tube-shaped, which is called tubular, or they can be round-shaped, which is called asinar. Uh, they can also be a spectrum of in-betweenish shapes, like kind of round tubes or sort of oblong uh, uh, round areas, sort of stretchy round areas, and that sort of in-between is called tubulo asinar. Uh, exocrine glands can also be either branched or simple, right? Simple means that they do not have a branch. They just have one tube that goes where it needs to go. If they are branched, that means that um, that you have like multiple glands or multiple glandular areas that are all feeding into the same place. Uh, and this branching can occur either in the gland portion before the duct, in which case it is still considered simple, or the branching can occur in the duct portion. If you have more than one duct that joins together, that is called a compound arrangement. So to give you sort of an example of this, right here we see a simple tubular gland. It's tubular, you can see that it, it comes down, it's not a sphere, it comes down in this sort of low B thing, and then you have one duct leads to the surface. Simple. Here we have a simple branched tubular gland. These are tubes, they're sort of these finger looking projections, and you have multiple projections that join together but the area of the duct is labeled here in blue, and you can see that this branching occurs before you get to the duct. So it is simple and branched. Uh, these sort of tubular glands that look like long projections, they can either be straight, going basically in one direction, or they can be coiled, where they're not just gonna go one direction, but they'll sort of go back and forth, they'll go down a bit, they'll come up a bit, then they'll go back down a bit, and they may have multiple, multiple coils within them. So this is a simple coiled tubular uh, gland. Uh, this is, I know that you can't quite see the difference between this and this in the picture here. Um, but ideally this should be something that comes down more like this and then goes into a circle and then comes back up. Whereas this is something that comes down more like that. Um, the ASINR will, will usually look like maybe a flask or something like that. So this is a simple asinar gland. This is a simple branched asinar gland where these are going to be sort of round things as opposed to this where they're going to be long sort of projections. I know that it's not ideally pictured in this picture here. Um, those are all simple, meaning that they join together before the duct. 
down here, we can see some compound branched uh, glands. Here you can see we have uh, tubular finger-like projections. We actually have several that join together before the duct, but then you can see this duct area here joins with two other duct areas. So we have a joining after the duct, and that makes it a compound gland. Here we see sort of the same thing, except these are sort of roundish acinar rather than the longer tubular ones. And again, you have multiple ducts connecting together, so it is a compound acinar. The tubular acinar um, will, will often, or tubulo acinar will often, instead of uh, having um, a, uh, instead of having a, uh, 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 just a round thing coming out, they'll they'll uh, look even more sort of goblet shaped where you have a long bit that is then connected to a round bit at the end rather than just being long and skinny or just being round. So you can see here there's sort of a, this look kind of like flasks or vases. Uh, exocrine glands are also classified by function, how they work. Uh, and uh, glands can be classified as uh, marocrine. Marocrine glands are going to function by exocytosis, right? Basically what we talked about before. You would think that this is how glands would operate. Uh, based on what we know about them, but this is actually only one of several mechanisms. So here we have our endoplasmic reticulum, which is making the protein that's going to be secreted or the whatever is going to be secreted. And that goes to the Golgi complex where it gets packed into these vesicles. These vesicles go up to the surface where they meld with the uh, plasma membrane and they release their substance into the world. Um, a uh, the cell is not damaged in this. Uh, they don't lose any cellular material. They just give forth whatever it is that they are secreting. A good example of marocrine secretion, uh, marocrine glands are the salivary glands. Basically, you pack saliva containing water and salivary enzymes into these secretory vesicles, which are then taken to the surface, and then they break free. Uh, another model is apocrine secretion. With apocrine secretion, what you have is um, a cell, right? The cell makes whatever it is going to secrete and then packs all of that thing that it's going to secrete into the top of the cell. The top of the cell then breaks free from the bottom of the cell as one huge unit. So you're losing a good chunk of the cell material, and then that chunk breaks up further into smaller pieces. Then the cell has to regrow its larger portion, it has to regrow its top before it can break free again. But the cell doesn't die. It has to regenerate this portion that's gone away, but it isn't dead. Um, apocrine secretion is actually ends up being a lot less common than we once thought it was. And we will, in this class, talk about things that are called apocrine glands, but actually don't do apocrine secretion. We still call them apocrine glands because they were once thought to do that. These are a type of sweat gland. There's a type of sweat gland called apocrine sweat glands. They're still called that, but they don't use apocrine secretion. One example of where apocrine secretion is used is in mam mammary glands. So uh, breast milk is made this way. 
Uh, the proteins that go into the milk gather in the top part of the cell that breaks free and then it itself breaks up into small pieces that go into making the proteins in and lipids in the milk. Our third and last portion is uh, what are called holocrine glands. Now, apocrine means that it's the apex. Apex means top that is breaking away. Holocrine means that the whole cell is going to dissolve. The entire cell is going to fill with whatever it is that it's secreting, and then the entire cell breaks apart. This kills the cell. Obviously, the cell has to be replaced by a new cell. So usually what you have is a basal cell, and the basal cell will divide into two cells. So it undergoes cell division to make a second cell, and then that second cell breaks apart to become the secretion product. Uh, then the first cell replicates again to make a new second cell. So you have a first cell whose job is to replicate, and then whenever it replicates, the new cell breaks apart to become the product. Um, this uh, is, is actually a reasonably common uh, type of... Uh, uh, secretion. Sebaceous or skin oil glands are an example of this. So sebaceous glands, skin oil glands work by having this double layer where the top layer is constantly breaking apart and then the bottom layer is constantly reproducing to make a new top layer. This is actually relatively common, uh, especially with oily secretions. Okay, so take home messages for this uh, video. Uh, first off, you should know what a gland is. Secondly, you should know what an exocrine gland is and what makes that different from an endocrine gland. Third, you should be able to define and recognize glands based on their shape and uh, and formative characteristics. Are they branched or unbranched? Are they simple or complex compound? And are they tubular asinar or tubulo asinar? And know what each of those terms means, being able to recognize them in a picture. Third, you should know the difference between uh, Merocrine, apocrine, and holocrine glands, and you should be able to recognize these glands based on their characteristics. If I tell you that uh, this gland uh, is always has the top of it breaking off and then it has to regenerate the top, you should recognize that that means it is an apocrine gland. Um, you should also recognize the examples of the types of glands that uh, that I gave you as examples, right? And if I was to tell you that a gland worked in a particular way, you should be able to label it as holocrine, apocrine, or uh, merocrine.